Good evening, New Heights. Thanks for tuning in for another sermon in the book of Daniel. As we continue in this sermon series, we come to chapter 10 tonight, where we see uh, Daniel encountering um, a vision of a man. And um, and in this vision, there's going to be a lot of prophecy revealed as well. And so tonight, another one of our ministry interns is bringing the word to you out of Daniel chapter 10. Uh, tonight, we have Corey Bonasso, who is going to be preaching for us. Uh, Corey's been a member of our church for some time, and he is is a great asset to our church. We've been developing him and his theological understanding as well as just his ministry. And uh, we are overjoyed to have him at our church and we're thrilled to have him preaching to you tonight. So if you got a Bible, open to Daniel chapter 10 and let's jump into the sermon together. Hello, New Heights. Uh, welcome back. Hope everyone's doing well today. Uh, everyone is returning to the new normal, so to speak. Well, uh, we're continuing in our uh, Daniel series today. We're here at the beginning of the end in chapter 10 today. Uh, so I'll, I'll pray and then we'll jump here and jump in here. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for today. Just this time we get to spend in your word. We ask that you would reveal yourself to us. Use me as your instrument, Lord, that you would uh, bring truth to our lives and uh, bring us closer to you through your word, Lord. We love you and we thank you and pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so as I said, we're in chapter 10 today. Uh, now, chapters 10, 11, and 12 of Daniel, they are the, uh, the detail, the description of Daniel's final vision of his life. And chapter 10 really is the setup, the prelude uh, to the remaining chapters, the explanation of the vision, that, the vision that comes in chapters 11 and 12. And so just as some background here, uh, this play takes place about two years after the events of chapter 9, where Gabriel came to Daniel and explained the 70 weeks, uh, describing the age of the Gentiles. So this puts Daniel about 90 years old at this time. Um, and also an important point that I'll come back to later. Uh, during this point, the, a group of Israelites has already been sent back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple at the decree of the Medo-Persian king who took over Babylon from Nebuchadnezzar. And so we notice that Daniel is not part of that rebuild. He didn't go back to Jerusalem with that group of Israelites to do the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, it may be due to his old age, travel might be hard on him. However, I, th I think the more likely explanation is that he has a, a very respected reputation. He is well liked by everyone in the uh, Babylonian circle. And I think the king of Babylon, the Medo-Persian king in place there, probably wanted Daniel close by to have him as his advisor. And that's why he's not uh, with the remnant in Israel to rebuild the temple. So let's jump in. We'll read verses 1 through 9 to start. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and I listened to him. And as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. So we'll stop there. And, and as we see Daniel here, he's given this great vision uh, at the beginning of the chapter, what is to become uh, of Israel during the age of the Gentiles, which is to say the period of time uh, when Israel is under subjection to Gentile nations. And this began with the Babylonian invasion some 75 years prior uh, when they came and conquered Jerusalem and when Daniel was a teenager, he was about 14 or 15 when Babylon came in. And so Daniel, he's mourning here over this vision that he's seen. And we'll see in chapters 11 and 12 that this is because he now knows of the suffering that Israel will have to go through before redemption. Uh, he's mourning for his people, for his nation, and so this inner turmoil, he, he has an outward expression of it in uh, his fasting. He didn't eat any enjoyable food. He didn't drink any wine. He didn't use any lotions in the dry climate, which would have been uh, tough on his skin. He was showing an outward expression of the inner despair, the inner turmoil that he felt. He wanted to align his inner feelings with his outward uh, expressions. 
So he took no joy in an activity that would otherwise be joyful, which eating and drinking. Uh, and so Daniel, as I said, was he was the, in the first generation of Israel to be taken captive. He was a teenager when Babylon came in. So he was old enough to understand and appreciate the independence that Israel had up to that point. Um, and it made it that much more painful when he was taken into subjection by the Babylonians. And also, up to this point, Israel had been independent and powerful since their exodus from Egypt. Uh, we're told in Genesis 46 that when Jacob's family, which numbered about 70 people, went down to Egypt, when they moved there during the famine of Joseph's time, uh, they were about 70 people. And so it was a big family, but not, not a nation by any means. It was not certainly large enough to be classified as a nation. However, during their time in Egypt, they did grow into a nation. Um, so Daniel, he's, he's mourning for this period of three weeks, and that actually, that three weeks extends over the week of Passover, which is appropriate in this sense because Israel, the Passover is Israel's Independence Day. It celebrates their deliverance from Egypt, from slavery, from subjection to freedom, to independence under God's power. It was a celebration of Israel's liberation, and they had been free uh, f from any nation up until Babylon came in. So Daniel, he's mourning during Israel's Independence Day, and now he's been in captivity for the majority of his life. And the vision that he receives, he now understands that the captivity of Israel is far from over. And so he is in deep mourning over all of this. And we see from these verses that, that even Daniel, who's highly esteemed by God, he, he did not get his desire during his lifetime. He wanted to go home. He wanted to, uh, he wanted Israel to be independent. And he, he prayed for that from God. However, God didn't answer that prayer. He had a greater purpose for Daniel where he was in Babylon. And, and I think this is a truth that applies to everyone, all Christians, all believers. And it's a tough pill to swallow. The knowledge that we desire a good thing and we pray earnestly for a good thing, it may not be granted to us in this life. And that's, that's a difficult truth to face. Um, and God, he may have a greater purpose in withholding a certain request from us, even if it's for a good thing. And, and I believe that our reaction to this sort of difficult truth really is a test of spiritual maturity. Uh, are we going to be someone who resents God and we throw a tantrum because he's withholding something from us that we believe is good? Or will we trust in him that his plan for us and his goal for us is greater? And even though we want a good thing, he has something even better for us in mind. And I encourage us all just to humble ourselves and to remember that truth, uh, that we would ask God to align our prayers and our desires with his will and his desires, because we understand that his plan is so much greater for us than we could ever imagine. <clears throat> so moving on here in these verses again, we see, uh, so Daniel is describing a figure hovering over the middle of the, of the waters in the river. And from this description, we can conclude that this figure is Jesus Christ in his glorified pre-incarnate form. And from the description we see, it also matches the description that John gave in, uh, of Jesus in Revelation 1. And I want to read those verses to you here shortly, starting verse 12, Revelation 1. Uh, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I saw, turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. <laughs> So here in this comparison, we see two different men describing the same thing. And you could, you could see the similarities in their comparisons. The belt of gold, a golden sash, face like lightning, face as white as snow, eyes like flaming torches, eyes like blazing fire, arms and feet of polished bronze, feet like bronze glowing in a furnace, voice like a multitude, voice like the sound of rushing waters. And so we, the fact that they don't use the exact same thing to describe uh, what they're looking at would make sense because they're two different men from two different time periods trying to describe something they've never seen before in their own experience, things in their own life, trying to compare it and, and bring a visual representation. <laughs> and of course, that's something this, you'll get that with anyone. You ask two different people to describe the same object, you'll get variation. That's a natural thing. <clears throat> but however, we see that the response that Daniel and John both had was very much the same. They both fall into a deep sleep as though dead. And that, I think, that is the 
response, the common response, the uniform response we see of men encountering God in his holiness throughout Scripture. Uh, and even with angels sometimes, that we see the, the glory of angels. Men just fall prostrate before angels. So this reaction, it's, it's natural because when sinful man is exposed to the pure holiness and glory of God firsthand, we become acutely aware of our sin and we're ashamed of our sin. And we, the holiness of God shows us just how sinful and terrible we really are in our, in our fleshly state. Uh, so we'll, we'll go on here. Daniel is face down the dirt and we'll pick up in verse 10, read through the end of the chapter here. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. While, I was, while he was saying this to me, I bowed my face toward the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I feel very weak. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, Do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. So we see when Daniel sees Jesus again, he's face down in the dirt. Uh, he sees Jesus in his glory, and he's in his deep sleep. And then and we see Daniel being comfort, comforted. And I believe that the one that Daniel actually sees and who is speaking with him on the bank of the river is not Christ himself who was hovering over the waters uh, and who, who he described in uh, previous verses, but this is Gabriel the archangel who's come to directly minister to Daniel. And we see in verse 16, Daniel says, one resembling a human being, which again leads me to believe it's a different figure than Jesus himself because it's a different reference to a description. He could have simply referred back to his description before if he wanted to refer again to Jesus. And in chapter 8, again, we see uh, Christ is directing Gabriel to speak to Daniel and to minister him, to him, which is the function of angels we see all throughout Scripture. Angels, they are ministering spirits. We see this with Elijah. They, they come to Elijah and comfort him and bake bread uh, with Jesus after his 40 days of fasting in the desert and the temptations of Satan. The angels come and minister him after those 40 days. And we see this again with Daniel and other parts of his book. Angels are God's bridge to men with regard to personal encounters such as this one because God cannot, in his sinless perfect state, have direct interaction with man or else it would kill us because we are sinful. And so angels are that bridge between man and God with certain encounters and Gabriel specifically with encounters with Daniel. And so throughout this whole exchange, we see that Daniel is having a pretty tough time keeping it together. Uh, we know that he's old. He's almost 90 years old. He's, he's reaching the end of his life. He's been fasting for three weeks. And furthermore, he, he is emotionally drained because he's been in mourning and turmoil over this vision that he has seen. <clears throat> uh, and so we could, uh, we could say, well, of course, he doesn't have any strength because of all these different things. However, I, I believe that if even if Daniel were young and in peak physical condition, the re result would have been the same. He would have had no physical strength. When God reveals himself to us, it knocks us down. It, it wipes us out. It reveals just how weak and fragile we are in our own flesh. His glory is so magnificent that it takes more strength than we actually have in our fleshly bodies to encounter it, to really take it in, to have any sort of response other than something resembling death. And so here we see that God provides the strength to Daniel through Gabriel. Gabriel told Daniel that he had come to reveal the meaning of Daniel's vision, and it made Daniel speechless. And this is not to say that Daniel was at a loss for words, or he just didn't know what to say. Daniel here, he physically couldn't talk. He had no strength even to speak words. <laughs> and so we see in verse 16 that Gabriel touched Daniel's lips to give him strength to speak. And at this point, in my interpretation, it seems that Daniel has strength 
only to speak because he says, as soon as his lips are touched, I'm overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord. I feel very weak. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. Then we see Gabriel touch him again, tell Daniel, be courageous, be strong. And that seems to do the trick because then Daniel stands and he tells Gabriel he's ready to receive the message. He's gotten strength from God supernaturally and he's ready to receive it. And this really, it's an excellent picture of how we should approach God. If we ask God to reveal himself to us, we have to be ready to be knocked down because it's more than he can, it's more that we can handle if he reveals himself to us and we're not ready. His splendor, it's simply too much for our human minds to take in and have it register on any sort of level that we could perceive or understand. But thankfully, we know that God doesn't only reveal himself to us and then leave us with our face in the dirt. He gives us the strength to receive whatever message that he has for us. And so moving on, we, we see here that Gabriel is, or Daniel has been praying earnestly for understanding of this vision for th three weeks now. And we see the reason for God's, what seems like a delay. Uh, God actually dispatched Gabriel to go to Daniel at the moment that he was praying, when Daniel was actually praying three weeks prior. <clears throat> In chapter 9, we see a similar pattern where Daniel is praying for the redemption of Israel and for the sins of the nation, and Gabriel is dispatched and shows up even before his prayer is over. And then Dan and Gabriel gives Daniel wisdom and understanding of the 70 weeks in, in that prophecy. Uh, <laughs> here we see that Gabriel, he was coming quickly again, but this time he was withstood by the prince of Persia. And now we don't know a lot about this figure, this prince of Persia. It's unlikely that it's Satan uh, because it's not a reference in the Bible uh, that is used for Satan. However, we, we think it's, it's likely a high-ranking demon in Satan's hierarchy. Um, Persia, which is in current day Middle East, specifically Iraq, it's, it's Satan's home ground. You can see this throughout all of scripture. It's his prized possession in the world. It's the area where the Garden of Eden was, where Satan tempted Eve. It's where Babylon was, which all throughout scripture is a symbol of evil. It's the headquarters of evil throughout scripture is Babylon. And so it makes sense that a high-ranking uh, official or a high-ranking demon in Satan's hierarchy would have uh, charge and be in charge of this uh, sacred ground to Satan. Now, we don't know what this conflict is about, was about. As I mentioned earlier, the remnant was in Israel rebuilding the temple. It could have been some sort of a battle to prevent that, to come against the Israelites to rebuild the temple and frustrate their efforts. Uh, however, I believe that it's simply something that we never have any idea about because God prevented it, because he sent Gabriel and Michael to prevent the efforts of Satan. And this, this again, many things, many evil things happen in this world, and we see it all the time. Just turn on the news, you can look and see any story any day, and it's, you can just see the evil in the world. And many times it leads us to ask, why would God let something so evil, so terrible happen in this world? However, our, our finite minds cannot understand all of God's purposes. He, he works all events, evil and, evil and good, for his good, for his plan. And we must only trust in him that he will bring his plan to fruition. And we must also understand that there are many evil schemes of Satan that God does not allow. And he does this in order to protect us. Everything that God has, everything that God does, it is for a purpose. If God wanted to use something for his plan, he will do it. And if something is taking place that doesn't promote his purpose or his plan, then he will prevent it. It's as simple as that. Uh, it's not our job to understand why certain bad things happen. It's only our job to trust God and to know that his plan is perfect, even when we don't understand everything that's happening. And so another takeaway that I get from these verses is that the spiritual warfare in this world is very real. In the words of Kevin Spacey, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was to convince the world that he didn't exist. And if you've ever seen The Usual Suspects, you'll appreciate that quote. But even as a Hollywood line, it's that statement is still very accurate. Satan, he has a massive amount of power over those that deny his existence. Because in, in today's world, that's a pretty large number of people. If someone doesn't believe that Satan even exists, they're certainly not going to do anything to prevent against his attacks. And therefore, he has all the power he wants over them. And in today, we live in a society, especially America, where science and logic and reason are king. And while those are good things, um, they can't be elevated above scripture. 
And we live in a, in a time when if it can't be proven with hard data, then it's simply theory or myth. <clears throat> and the world, it sees scripture as a book full of myths and stories, not as historical fact or truth. One of those truths that the world discounts is the existence of a spiritual realm. And as believers, we have to make the decision for ourselves whether we want to fit our understanding of science and logic into that foundational framework of scriptural supremacy and truth, or the other way around. If we take what science tells us and fit it into that scriptural framework, then we're on the right track. But if we take scripture and say, well, I've learned this about science, how can I take scripture and make it make sense with what I know about science and logic in the physical world? We're already backwards in that case because we need to take scripture and say, this is a foundational truth. This is true. How do I take what I can see and perceive in the physical world and reconcile it to this scriptural foundational truth? If we're on that path, then God will reveal himself to us even greater. And one of those truths that scripture tells us is that wars are, they are raging in the spiritual realm. And they're significant because they affect us here in the temporal, the physical realm. Daniel was in anguish for three weeks because he was waiting for an answer from God, even though God had sent an answer to him at the time of his prayer. Had it not been for a spiritual battle that detained Gabriel, Daniel would have had his understanding of the vision immediately, and he wouldn't have been left in the dark for nearly a month. So we see that Daniel was so highly esteemed and his, and his vision was so important that God sent Michael, another archangel, to assist Gabriel in order to allow Gabriel to break away from the fight and to come to Daniel. That's how powerful prayer is and can be. God sent his top two angels to Daniel in the middle of a fierce spiritual battle just to answer Daniel's prayer. This should encourage us that our prayers, even if they seem like they're not being heard or that they're being ignored, they can have a tremendous impact on the work of God. If we intercede and pray earnestly for God, for his work to be done, then he hears us and he will act upon it. And so I'll recap here just to finish up. This chapter, while it's simply, it seems like it's simply setting the stage, a prelude to these final three chapters in the book, it really shows us a lot about God's character. It all points to Jesus Christ and his redemption through the resurrection. Daniel earnestly sought God, but he didn't hear from him for several, week, several weeks. He was in anguish over the fate of his nation Israel. However, he remained faithful and did not lose hope. Uh, he understood that God works in his own perfect timing, not a second sooner, not a second later. And in his perfect time, Jesus will return and he will carry out the fulfillment of God's plan for his people. And when God finally did come to answer Daniel's prayer, it wiped him out and knocked him on his knees, on his face. Yet God gave Daniel supernatural strength through Gabriel to receive the message that God wanted Daniel to have. And friends, I want that to encourage us that if, if we are to have any understanding of God's plan or his character, we must also ask for God's strength to understand and receive the message that God wants us to have. And finally, we must remember that there are spiritual forces at work in this world. They're trying to destroy the people of God. They're trying to derail the plan of God. We can't dismiss these as trivial, for the power at work in the spiritual realm would make us tremble if we were to truly see it. However, we must also not fear. We can remain strong in our faith and remember that no matter what evil forces are at work against God, their efforts are futile. To say that God will win the battle is not accurate. God has already won the battle. He won the battle when Jesus rose from the dead and walked out of the tomb. <clears throat> and friends, we are on this side of victory. Jesus has brought us the blessing through his redemptive grace, and we have victory because he has victory. And church, let, us, let that encourage us this week. Father, we thank you so much for your victory, for your plan, for your strength that you give us to receive your message, Lord. We ask that you would continue to strengthen us this week and continue to re reveal yourself to us every day. We love you and pray this in your son, Jesus' name. Amen.